Ryan. We move now to um, a, an opportunity for questions and answers. The, there is a microphone here. If you'd like to ask a question, please just make your way to this uh, microphone and then we'll be able to hear what you're saying and Ryan will be able to hear as well. While you're gathering your thoughts, perhaps I could just ask you a question. In terms of um, the recovery of religious robustness, say, and uh, a restoration of the religious authority, the ecclesiastical authority that Lord Acton was concerned about, to what extent do you think it, a, a society such as Australia's would, have, would be served if religious communities were to order their own lives by religious law? So, for example, to what extent might religious religion become more robust if Sharia law was to be uh, applied by the, by the Islamic community? At what point would the rule of law be compromised by that kind of robustness? Yes, excellent, excellent question. And um, that phrase uh, in Lord Acton's quote, I mean, stands out to any modern reader, especially one who's been watching the television for the past couple uh, weeks here in Sydney, that phrase, to administer its own laws, which immediately brings to mind, ah, you must be talking about Sharia uh, laws or something like that. Um, I think the first thing to say is that I, I tried to note in my uh, lecture, and, and it, it does need to be stressed again, is that the freedom of religion does not mean a free-for-all. This is not any group claiming to be religious can do anything it wants to do. Every group, every institution, religious or otherwise, in a civil society has to operate within uh, those boundaries that, that I articulated. Uh, public health, public order, um, the, the use of nonviolence and, and uh, persuading others, um, and it has to respect the rule of law. So what I would hope that we could do as religious bodies is come to discern that there are ways in which we should um, defend the robust freedom to, for groups to administer their own laws without jumping immediately to the conclusion that that means that everything, including Sharia, um, is acceptable. Now, ev every set of laws, every set of activities um, and um, regulations and rules by which a group administers its own behavior within a civil society, has to abide by the rule of law. Right? So we're not talking about groups going out and doing whatever they please. I think you could um, evaluate Sharia law in terms of some basic civil, um, some civil rights, uh, the respect of the rule of law, nonviolence, some of these things, and find it wanting. So we have good grounds for, for defending um, the stance against uh, allowing for Sharia law. But when the Baptist Church wants to hire employees to uh, fulfill its mission, that does not uh, disrupt public peace, public order, it respects the rule of law, and therefore within those boundaries, the Baptist Church should be able to do that. Thank you, Peter. Thank, thank you, Ryan. Um, I think you've described a situation similar in many ways, of course, to Australia. Um, I just wonder, um, uh, more as a suggestion really, whether there might be a way around this. Um, if we cease to try and claim some sort of special status for religion, i.e. seek some religious exemption um, under these various um, laws, uh, and instead perhaps sneak in under the, uh, under the guise of diversity. So, uh, you know, just as... Um, uh, you can't discriminate against me because I'm, I'm a POM. Um, so you wouldn't be able to discriminate against somebody to practice their religious behaviour. Uh, and that would give you perhaps a, a, the sort of, not only a degree of freedom, but the ability to stand up and defend yourself on the grounds of uh, you are who you are. Right, that's, that's an excellent point. I, I think that as a church or a religious institution, uh, enters into these public conversations and, and, and talks about public laws. It needs to figure out um, every sort of language and argument that would be effective. Uh, the one right now that has seemed to uh, caught traction in the United States has to do with religious liberty because it's right there in the Bill of Rights. There's a long tradition of appealing to that, and that seems to have been an argument around which uh, many churches 
have been happy to coalesce. But I would agree, we need to uh, consider other arguments as well, uh, particularly in, um, in Australia, where there might not be the equivalent of, I, I think you have section 116, but it's not as, uh, um, it doesn't contain the exact same language as, as the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights in the United States. So there might need to be other, other ways to try to uh, engage our conversation partners uh, to, to promote this sort of freedom. That's right, you know, pointing out, listen, you want a pluralistic society, you want diversity, you want to hear the different voices and allow the imaginations of these different institutions to, uh, to contribute in their own way. You need to protect the freedom which will allow them to do that. So that's, that's a good suggestion. If I could just make a comment uh, first, as a lawyer, I think what you're talking about was exemplified when we used to have private acts of parliament, which governed um, the activities, both commercial and community, in many ways. It exemplified what you're talking about, that the, the state recognised areas of authority, be it a canal company, a railway company, a, a, a livery guild, a church. Uh, we still do, to a degree, with... Uh, uh, I speak from uh, being the procurator for my own church, the Presbyterian Church, like Church Council. There is a, a property trust act, like most churches do, but they're now public acts, which means that the state, in a sense, doesn't recognise that that community needs its own. But the other point that I think we have trouble with with discrimination, though, is um, that when you talk about the rule of law, there's an inbuilt tension these days because certain sets of values are inbuilt into the rule of law. So when you're talking about an exemption for discrimination, you are faced with those values that say you cannot discriminate on certain grounds being part of the rule of law. And so you... That's right, and that, that's an excellent point, which goes to show the non-neutrality of the state and of legislation and, and, and things like this. It, every law and the rule of law itself, you know, presupposes some moral judgment behind it. And, and so, yes, this is where societies simply have to come together. They have to talk and they have to decide as a society what sort, where will we draw that line of, of freedom? What, what crosses that line? In, in the United States, you know, 50 years ago, it was decided that um, um, racism crossed the line. And so even if your church said, according to its most fundamentally held beliefs, uh, that uh, uh, black people were to be treated different from white people, discriminated against at the, uh, on the bus or the, the counter in the restaurant, um, that they were not allowed to do that in this civil society. And so we have to have that, we, we, have, to, uh, we have to come together as a society and debate those values. And, and I think a better conversation would be had if we all recognized up front, we bring values to the table, we're not claiming to be neutral, the state is not neutral, Everybody has an idea of the good for this society. Let's talk about it and try to persuade one another. But again, we need the freedom for those sorts of robust conversations. Good point. We've got a question from Adam next. In the wheelchair. Thanks. Uh, so one thing you may have noticed about Australia is the amount of government funding that charities and churches uh, sort of expect by right. If governments try to withdraw Grant X or Grant Y, everyone goes public and says, oh, they can't possibly do that. So is there a problem in that as soon as you accept the uh, state's money, you invariably accept its rules? Yes, good point. I'm forgetting the quote about he who, um, yeah, um, that's right. And it's something that uh, really came to a head in this particular question when the United States was uh, dealing with the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives, uh, where it was viewed that it was an office that was started uh, in the White House to dole out money to different religious organizations. It was not quite the intent of uh, the, the faith-based initiative. Um, 
And, and oftentimes those of us who were trying to, to argue for the policy on the one hand by saying if the government is going to give money, religious groups should have the same uh, level playing field for applying for that money as any other group. So not to discriminate against them because they're religious. So trying to make that argument in public while trying to make the argument to private institutions like churches and religious organizations be very careful about asking for money. Right? Um, because when you do that, then you place yourself um, under certain restrictions, uh, uh, under a, a larger uh, realm of restrictions than you otherwise would. I mean, one, one of the, the troubling things about this HHS mandate is that it applies to every employer regardless of whether you receive a penny from, from the government, um, which is what makes it such an egregious um, violation of liberty. To what extent is this the result of elevation of the liberty of the individual or a distorted version of that over other important rights and freedoms? For example, what scope is there to argue back with notions like freedom of association or indeed the principle of subsidiarity to combat what's happening? Yeah, excellent point. It's one of the reasons I just love this Lord Acton quote, even though parts of it are laborious and out-of-date language. He, he, he foreshadows so many of these trends, and, and the one that, that you're um, talking about, that uh, the state has sought to emancipate the freedom from, oh, let's just read it as Lord Acton said, it recognizes liberty only in the individual. Why? Because it is only in the individual that liberty can be separated from authority. That's fascinating. We give a whole other lecture on the relationship between freedom and authority. We've come today to think of the human being as an autonomous rights bearer and authority as uh, this sort of um, diametrically opposed phenomenon to freedom. Actually, authority is the counterpart to freedom. We are more free when we stand under proper authority that can guide us and direct us to our true ends for our own benefit. Um, but we are, our, our culture um, has, has come to the place where those are immediately are, are viewed as, as opposites, and that has led us into all sorts of trouble. It, it ends up, as I tried to say, um, elevating the power of the state, because now the state is the sole institution left that can adjudicate rights claims against an individual to individual. Um, so it, it's, we need to recover the, a robust conversation about um, sphere subsidiarity, uh, sphere sovereignty, um, the, the public authority and role and functions of other social institutions in the public square. Hello, thank you for your lecture. It was um, wonderfully um, erudite. I speak as a Christian woman with a particular concern around um, constraints around witness in Australia. And I picked up in your speech that you spoke about the church's witness um, being a very nature a public witness. And yet in Australia, there are many codes of conduct that restrict witness um, in institutions and organisations. And I think that actually brings us to the debate about rights and you spoke about, um, for instance, in the um, International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, that our rights are actually constrained by that one phrase, whether they are actually against public health um, and also morals is in that. And that, I guess, brings us to the point that human rights actually, in the end, are pitted against each other and ultimately are resolved through public debate and through public processes of developing law and dialogue. And um, my, my question is, um, to what extent do you feel um, the issue of a church's witness um, pertains to liberty of conscience and liberty of religion? And is there any likelihood that that might be constrained in public debate through um, I guess, concerns about vilification. As, you know, because rights sort of... And I'm, I'm thinking also about the insult law debate in UK at the moment and how people are trying to repeal the insult, 
insult law there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. To what extent do you see the church's witness being linked to liberty of um, freedom of conscience of, and religion? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a, a tricky one, especially with the propensity today for us to think, to, to bring our assumption of the, auto the radical autonomous individual to the way we, we understand conscience. Um, and this is why, honestly, I, I tried to uh, downplay the language of conscience in my own lecture and to, to play up more the language of the, uh, the proper authority and role of other institutions in, in society. Um, because we've come to think today about conscience as something separate from the truth about which our conscience should guide us toward. Uh, so you're going to get very different answers uh, about um, the, the employment of conscience language depending on how you understand the human being and the nature of the church and, and these sorts of deep questions. Uh, however, there is the, the practical, uh, strategic, prudential question of how do we make arguments in the public square uh, for rights and abilities and opportunities that we might defend on other grounds within our own community. Um, and now there might be a you know, space there to use the language of conscience and to appeal to uh, the violation of conscience. Um, I'm aware that that's you know, probably a, an important uh, tool right now in Victoria for doctors um, who, who are having their um, consciences violated. Um, by, by state laws. Uh, so it, it, I, I think it's a very important um, idea. It requires a lot of careful use, but I'm not going to rule out a, a place for it strategically in the public square. I hope that answers your question. We can talk later. It strikes me as though it's not very unusual for you as a Catholic to um, be opposed to employees of Catholic organisations um, receiving contraception. Uh, but for somebody who happens to work for a Catholic hospital in the United States, they may very well want to have contraception as part of their insurance packets. Wouldn't it make more sense to argue that there's no necessary link between employment and health insurance? It strikes me as odd that the United States has a system whereby health insurance comes through and uh, through your employer. Wouldn't it make a lot more sense to say those two things should be totally separate? Yeah, a, a couple of different good topics there. I, I would agree with the fact that in the United States we need to reform our health care system and separate uh, health insurance from uh, being employed. I, I just, yes we need to reform in that direction. However, given the law as it stands now, we have to ask, on what grounds can an, employer, an employee demand something that they want from their employer? And you, again, you have to kind of talk and, and figure out you know, where that, that line is. The, the employer starts the company, he risks the investment, he, um, he develops the organization, and he enters into a free agreement with potential employees. Here's what I'm willing to offer. According to this, are you willing to work for me? So I would say that every current employee of a hospital in the United States has entered voluntarily into an agreement with their employer with the um, health plan that the employer wants to offer. The employee has certain degree of freedom to leave and to try to find other employment opportunities that align with a better uh, health program or a, a set of benefits as, as he or she would define it. Um, but, I, but the employee may want a lot of other things. Um, and so just because the employee wants it doesn't make it grounds to demand it through the law. And then we would have to talk more in detail about the specifics of that. 
Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Messmore, for an excellent paper. But are there not some grounds for some of the concerns of the state authorities and for various classical liberals? And Peter Curdy made mention of Sharia law, but it's not just radical Islam that makes absolute truth claims and absolute claims with regards to behaviour. It's pretty much every religion. So if we're going to be playing the classical liberal Western democracy game, is there not a problem there of com radically competing um, value judgments and organisations that support them? In the, in the sense that, um, for instance, Catholicism makes various definite claims on what is right behaviour and just behaviour and how society is ordered, as does Judaism, as does Islam, as does Sikhism, Hinduism, etc. Um, now, these are competing truth claims, competing ideas of how to run a society. So, but then the civil society has another claim on what is how a society should run. So are there not some grounds for their concerns about the influences of religion? Yes, and those I would, um, as I argued earlier, would, would be um, provided uh, under the boundaries uh, which we laid out. A civil society has an interest in public health, public morals, nonviolence, the, the rule of law, those sorts of things. And so um, given that the government has the power that it has in the territorial boundaries of that regime, every institution must show that their own view of society corresponds with that view of society on those points. And if they do, then if they don't disrupt those sorts of things, then they should be allowed to, uh, to, to make the sorts of decisions that I'm advocating. sure if I understand what you're aiming at and perhaps I can illustrate that by way of an example. Let's say you've got an anti-discrimination law which says thou shalt not discriminate against homosexuals and you've got two employers. One belongs to a particular religious faith which preaches that homosexuality is an evil and therefore says look I don't want to employ homosexuals. Another one says I don't want to employ homosexuals but I just happen to dislike them but for no particular religious reason. Does the religious employer get a get out of jail free card when he wants to discriminate while the other one doesn't? Is that what you're effectively saying? I, I well, no, there, there are many other grounds to argue for the freedom of institutions and employers other than religious liberty grounds. So it's not to say that the only employers that should have that sort of freedom are, are religious liberty. But, but you do raise an interesting question, and this has come before the United States Supreme Court earlier this year, in, in fact, where the, uh, the notion of a ministerial exemption uh, was raised in terms of a religious school being able to hire and fire an employee. And the United States Supreme Court ruled 9-0 to zero that, yes, according to the United States Constitution, there is... A, a, a category of protection special to religion. Now, I'm not sure if that would be the same here in Australia or in other countries, but there, there are those constitutional grounds to argue on in the states, but there are plenty of other grounds to operate on. In fact, many, have, um, many of the critics of the HHS mandate are, are, are making exactly the argument you just made. Look, I, I'm not religious. Our company is a secular company. Um, my objections are, I would call them moral, not religious. But surely in America, don't I have the right to start my own company and make the decisions on who, who I can hire and what sorts of uh, benefits I can provide my employees? Um, so that all of those arguments are taking place. Some are grounded in religious liberty, uh, particularly in the, the constitutional language, and others are argued on more kind of general freedom grounds. Only a month ago, I met your countryman, George Weigel, the biographer of uh, Paul, uh, John Paul II. This was on occasion of the uh, Congress of uh, Christian Culture at the Catholic University of Lublin, Poland. The point was made, most uh, of the keynote speakers agreed, 
that uh, the current trend of uh, uh, relativism, a liberal one, could be compared to the uh, Stalin era persecution of religion in Soviet Union. The difference was uh, mentioned that uh, the f another one was violent and brutal, whereas the liberal as, uh, laicization or relativism is uh, uh, soft and hardly visible. I wholeheartedly is, uh, endorse to your call for a robust expression of the face. This exactly what millions of Catholics experience in Central Europe uh, under uh, some uh, uh, years ago uh, under Cardinals of Wyszyński and Wojtyla when there was a confrontation with uh, communist authorities. A price was to be paid for that. Uh, I was denied uh, a passport for 20 years. When I uh, read um, a few months ago in Europe the archives, uh, there was a political police to supervise me for many decades. Uh, and I <coughs> had no access to my favorite studies. I was uh, curtailed in my uh, work. When coming to this lucky country 30 years ago, I tried to share my experience. I introduced myself to key people uh, in the church, and um, uh, then I have a significant discussion with uh, my boss. Uh, my Lot and Molali law firm in Campbelltown is, uh, she was a Catholic, my friend, and uh, I mentioned him that I lost job uh, overseas because I uh, dared to put a cross on my desk. And what was his answer? You would be fired immediately if you do the same in this country. Uh, there was another experience. Uh, when I talked to a lady who was in charge of archdiocese media, uh, she termed me Catholic fundamentalist. Uh, next time, I tried to pretend to be meek. And um, I sent a paper to Catholic Weekly. It was not published. Uh, I made a approach uh, to a Catholic University on uh, North Sydney uh, a dozen years ago uh, to write a paper on uh, Christian mar modern Christian martyrology, bearing in mind the persecution in uh, primarily Catholic countries like uh, is Mexico uh, and Spain. So and Yes. So you have a question, would you like to yes. Ask I finished it by question. W uh, to what uh, extent I was wrong for last 30 years until I listened to uh, your encouragement to go robust. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. <laughs> those, are, um, th those are exactly the sorts of uh, things that the Pew Forum uh, study has shown. That, um, in fact, in every main region in the world, uh, re those kinds of restrictions on religion have increased uh, from 2008, 2009 to 2009, 2010, um, including in the United States. Thanks, Dr. Mesfor, for your lecture. Um, religious liberty has been obviously prominently featured in the debates over the HHS mandate. It even had non Catholics like Glenn Beck sort of saying, We're all Catholics now on this issue because many. Christians recognize that many other things were at stake. Um, although the idea of religious freedom has been prominently in the debate, another sort of line of argument which has been less um, sort of developed or looked at in public debate, um, which I was interested in your thoughts on, is um, actually questioning whether the sort of services that are being provided by the mandate are actually healthcare services, whether they're actually, they're put under the section of sort of preventative services, but whether contraception or abortifacients or abortions actually address a genuine healthcare need. Um, Sandra Fluke from Georgetown often sort of uh, talked about that prominently in defending that. So that was one 
question about whether that sort of style of argument addressing whether this is a genuine healthcare need is one. Then my other question was with regards to um, Obama's stance on this, uh, it doesn't, it just baffles me as to why he would dig his heels in on this issue when there doesn't seem to me to be some sort of huge benefit from doing this. I mean, he's gotten himself in a sort of a war with the Catholic Church and lots of other Christian institutions, particularly in the lead up to the presidential uh, elections now. What benefit does he get out of sort of holding the reins on this issue when he had multiple opportunities, particularly right after the release of it, to sort of make those religious exemptions or religious liberties much more clearer? Was it a bone to the left or something else? What was the reason for him sticking onto that? Yeah, uh, two, two great questions. I, I would love to see the United States become the kind of, be able to hold the kind of public discussion that would allow those sorts of arguments to be made. Unfortunately, right now, uh, contraception cannot be discussed rationally in the public square. It's, it's a hot potato issue. Uh, people have their, uh, their sound bites ready to throw at the other, you know, attacking women and, you know, all this sort of thing. And so we, we can't even have um, a, a healthy debate about this. But, th but I, I think that uh, your, your point is absolutely crucial. Not, not only does it violate aspects of the Constitution, it doesn't even uh, match the criteria of the mandate itself as calling for the, the provision of preventative, uh, uh, for medical uh, procedures uh, that um, can, can be, I forget the, the language, but, but used in, in the, when somebody is sick or ill or trying to, um, to solve something wrong with them. Well, you know, pregnancy does not fit those sorts of criteria. Um, you know, it's, yeah, we, uh, but I, I would love to see the ability to be able to argue that, but right now there's no space in public discourse to be able to, to make those sorts of arguments, unfortunately. Uh, secondly, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think Obama is um, a very crafty politician. I think he understands how long arguments can maintain focus in the public's mind, and he has offered enough diversionary tactics, enough smoke screens to say, well, we're gonna come up with an accommodation and then not address the issue. We're gonna push it off till after the election, and so we're doing something about it. So I think people who want to be able to receive contraception, people who want to be able to vote for Obama, that sort of thing, uh, are, are kind of, all they're wanting to do is to hear something like that. Okay, th there, there's an accommodation, so you don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, th this is going to be resolved, uh, you know, next fall. You don't have to worry you know, about it. And that's enough, I think, to keep the, uh, he thinks, to keep the, um, the issue on the back burner. Um, kudos to the Catholic Church for maintaining an amazing amount of focus on this issue for so many months in a row. I, I think that has probably surprised the administration. Um, but um, let me uh, thank the audience for uh, your attention. Oh, one more question. Oh, Andy. Yes, absolutely. We say the best of life. Thanks very much, Ryan. I, I did find your talk very thought provoking. Thank you. Um, this is a strategy question. If, uh, and I'm not sure that um, the approaches that you've suggested have covered both the angles that I'm going to suggest. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm wondering, it seems to me over the last years in Australia we've seen a, a huge centralism or a push for centralism in terms of central power and bigger government and so on. And, um, and I think you can argue against that fairly effectively, but it's a rational debate. But I think also there are real factors here of an aggressive, if you like, secularisation or something like that. And I suspect that needs a whole set of different strategies. So I'd like your thoughts on that. Uh, good question. Uh, I will say this. I, I think part of what I was trying to do tonight was to say that the first place to turn in answering that question is the church itself. We, we need to engage in our, with our secular uh, conversation partners, but we will not be able to do that well if we still um, accept a lot of these privatized assumption that I was talking about in our own practice of faith within the 
our various churches. So that's a starting point. We need to be uh, more effective in uh, talking with the person sitting next to us in the pew, through Sunday school classes, through catechetical strategies, through whatever, to understand what is the faith that we're talking about? What is religion? Uh, what does it mean to be faithful? What sorts of activities does that include? And as I would suggest, we need to, to explain how it includes all. It, it, religion is responding to God in all aspects of life. Um, and I think we could at least begin to use a better vocabulary within the church that would then challenge some of the assumptions that are sitting there unquestioned in public dialogue. There's a lot more to be said and answer that question, but that's where I would start. Yeah. And thank you to all our questioners. Ryan, um, just don't go away, because in addition to being the 14th, <coughs> excuse me, in addition to being the 14th Acton lecturer, you've also now entered the, um, the very elite pantheon of those who are entitled to give the vote of thanks at Acton lectures. Uh, it's only act the custom of uh, CIS is that it's past Acton lecturers give the vote of thanks at Acton lectures. So it's a great pleasure for me to welcome a former Acton lecturer, the Right Reverend Bishop Robert, Forsy Robert Forsyth, who is Bishop of South Sydney, who will give the vote of thanks tonight. Rob. Which raised the question, who gave the vote of thanks at the first Acton? Ladies and gentlemen, I have a, uh, a great pleasure, but a very difficult task. A uh, great pleasure to move the vote of thanks for Dr. Ryan Messimal for your timely, insightful, and very helpful lecture. The challenge is to try and bring very briefly what it is about the lecture that's been so helpful. I must say, um, although despite your gratuitous cultural insults at the beginning of the lecture, <laughs> we show your own trust in the robust freedom of Australians, and we, uh, we accept that. Uh, the issues you raise are real significant issues here in Australia and I believe um, will never finally be resolved. I think there are deep tensions in the very nature of religious institutions and, and liberal society that the, by, the mat, by their very nature these matters will remain always elements of being contested. There's only one place in Australia where the church state law, law is entirely clear. It's in the, it's in the town hall arcade near where I work. Um, the Anglican Church, which I'm a bishop, owns one side and the town hall the other, and there's a very helpful um, metal line down the middle. Um, if you ever want to see the church state line clearly, you know, there it is. <laughs> but only there, I'm afraid. Um, I, I really appreciate your drawing it as attention to Newbigin's, in fact, value distinction, but though I notice you, as I also think ought to be done, suggested that Newbigin, in fact, has overplayed it because the great challenge is when our culture regards certain values as facts. In Australia, it is equality and non-discrimination which trump any other value, uh, which is leading to major issues for churches and other bodies. And we're being faced with the awful situation of being exceptions. Why should the church be allowed to discriminate, said a recent article in the paper. We don't want to be allowed to discriminate. We want to have a place in civil society as genuine players, and that's the challenge that you drew our attention to, we're facing here. Can I make two further points? Um, I don't know what you think about this, but I think our culture has a deep fear of conflict. Perhaps the distinction between privatised religion versus public religion was a way to deal with some of the terrible conflicts that occurred in Europe in, that, in those appalling 30 years wars and so forth. And I think we're still on anxious about religious conflict, certainly in Australia, where sectarianism was a reality. Um, 60 years ago in this, in this city. It's a solution, which I think is a non-solution, but it's a solution. And it's interesting with Islam, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, in Australia anyway, people talk about the Islamic faith. That is, reading Islam through totally Christian eyes. That's not a Christian way to think about Islam at all. It's not a faith, it's a practice. And hence, one's going to follow with great interest um, the challenge now, not of the Roman Catholic Irish, who were once thought to be disloyal Australians, by us Tory Anglicans, now we've made friends with each other, sectarianism is gone, but there's a new challenge and I think that's massive. Nor should we protect Islam or any religion. I'm very anxious about laws protecting religions against being criticised. Terrible if that happens for all of us. Um, and one last word, I believe that we who are 
religious practitioners need to make sure we're playing a fair game. My church has a DNA of establishment. We once ruled the law in England about what you couldn't, couldn't say and believe, as your church has done in Europe in various places. We both are liberated from this, but we need to make sure that we're playing the game fairly. We don't just want freedom for ourselves. We want freedom for the society. And, that will, and that's a freedom will involve us where we also believe deeply in, in truths and what's good for society. Um, Dr. Messamore, you're very welcome to this country. I'm looking forward to hearing more and more of your contribution both in your professional life at Campion, but I hope you'll continue to engage vigorously in the public square as you have tonight. I can th cannot think of a more worthy act and lecture, so thank you very much, sir, for your contribution. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it just reminds me to thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening at uh, Mary McKillop Place. The next event in the Religion and Free Society program will be on Thursday the 8th of November at uh, CIS, that's at St Leonard's uh, in Oxley Street, when Andrew West, who is the host and presenter of the Radio National's Religion and Ethics program, will be talking about tradition and asking whether tradition is something that's worth defending. Details about that will be on the website at cis.org.au, this address behind me, so please do check that out and we look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>